Oh, sorry, didn't see you there. I tend to talk about rhythm a lot on this channel, which is because that's what my dissertation work is about and because when you learn music theory in school, you'll tend to get a metric ton of very specialized stuff about harmony and pretty much nothing about rhythm, though plenty of people are fighting against this tendency. So maybe I'm overcorrecting for that on this channel. Here's a video about harmony in a very intense piece of music by the funeral doom duo Bell Witch. This is an abbreviated version of an article that I wrote that was published in Metal Music Studies. Check that out if you want more of the details. But as sometimes happens, I don't really see any need for a whole lot more ado. So let's dive straight into talking about harmony in this intense, beautiful 82 minute piece of music. <laughs> hard to talk about such a long piece of music, and for this video I'm just going to focus on what happens to the pitch class F throughout the piece, because that's already plenty interesting and has a lot of interpretive potential. The piece is mostly in E-flat minor. It starts with bare octave E-flats, and we eventually get all the notes of the scale. The situation in this first chord, uh, where we have an E-flat in the upper voice and an E-flat in the lower voice, is kind of a promise of consonance and closure that haunts the rest of the piece. But instead of returning to this very often, we spend a whole lot of time with situations that aren't this. In the first huge chunk of the album, especially there's a ton of time that we spend with an F in the upper voice instead of an E flat, so we get this major ninth. Here's the, the first time that sound shows up. Another where we sit on the F for a while before it finally relaxes down to E flat. Here, we spend an eternity with just these two notes and they don't resolve at all. I'm going to make a little bit of a leap. When you're analyzing tonal stuff, and this is clearly tonal in the sense that we can have expectations for what counts as a relaxed sound versus a tense sound that come from the whole apparatus of diatonic harmony, one fancy thing to do is a reduction, which is where you basically say that one type of harmony is more important than others in a given time frame, and that the others are there more to kind of decorate it than to be structural. To avoid breaking up the flow of my argument too much, I'm going to stick a very important footnote about this at the end of the video. So if you want to see that now, you can skip to there. But let's say that the defining sound of a really big chunk of music here is this F over E flat sound, a dissonant step two uh, that mostly refuses to resolve down in the melody. <laughs> 
It's hard to do justice to just how much time we spend with this sound in our ears without playing really long stretches of the album. So I will just encourage you to go listen to it to get more of a sense for what I'm talking about. Maybe the most dramatic version of this refusing to resolve is in this riff from 34 minutes in, where we even get a repeated 5432 line that would sound very satisfying going to one. Instead, it just keeps circling back to five without ever landing on one. So I'm saying that's kind of the fundamental sound of the first huge chunk of the piece, an F natural over an E flat that creates tension while almost entirely refusing to resolve that tension. That goes on for a long time, longer than a lot of albums. But then about 50 minutes after the start of the piece, there's a modulation away from E flat minor to B flat minor. There's an ambiguous transitional passage, but then we know we're firmly in a different key when we start hearing a lot of C naturals in this section. is still an important pitch in the music, but in this new tonal context, it's a hollow perfect fifth above scale degree one instead of the dissonant major ninth that it has been for most of the piece so far. This clean passage is one of the most devastatingly beautiful bits of metal that I know about, and unfortunately I'm gonna forge ahead with the main thread I'm tracing here, which is plenty to go over in this video, but if you want to read some more about what's going on in this section, you can check out that article that I wrote. Eventually we make our way back to E flat minor. We know we're really there again when we get back to that B flat, C flat neighbor riff that we spent a while with earlier. to probably the most satisfying closure in E flat of the whole piece about 72 minutes after the expectation for that type of closure was set up first. traditional tonal sense, we've kind of done something conventional. We spent a while in E flat minor, we modulated to B flat minor for a while, the key of five, and then returned to E flat minor. That's cool, but the piece isn't over yet. And now F natural is back to being that dissonant, unfulfilled major ninth. This drama gets its own sort of closure though, in the clean coda that starts around 78 minutes. Here, I'm arguing that it's reasonable to hear the main sound as a D flat major chord because we spend so much time with that sound, even if we don't actually modulate to D flat major. D flat major chord, F is the consonant chord defining major third. This new role for F natural gives a nice closure to this very unusual but very inventive and satisfying arc. F natural goes from being a dissonant scale degree two in E flat minor 
to a consonant but hollow scale degree 5 in B flat minor. Back to a dissonant scale degree 2 in E flat minor. And finally to a consonant and vital scale degree 3 in the D flat major context of the coda. The album, like most funeral doom albums, plays heavily into the imagery of mourning and ghosts. But the link to these themes is more than just a genre convention here. The band has said that a huge influence on the album was the passing of their former bandmate, Adrian Guerra, before recording. And I will argue, in closing, the link to these themes is also more than just something in the lyrics and the sickest album cover of all time. And as a quick side note, um, it seems like this is the release that really put the artist Marius Lewandowski on the map. You've definitely seen his album covers all over the place since this album came out, for bands from Abigail Williams to Psychroptic to Humanity's Last Breath to False to Mismore. But anyway, so the link to Ghosts and Mourning isn't just in this sick album cover or the lyrics, but I argue in this harmonic journey, because I interpret the pitch class F as a sonic analog for loss and the process of rehabilitating it into a tonal structure as a sonic analog for mourning. The fact of the loss never changes. We get the F natural in prominent places throughout the entire piece, but what the music makes of it does change. For more than half of the piece, it grates longingly against the E-flat minor context. Maybe this is the initial pain and anger. It briefly becomes hollow as the scale degree 5 in B-flat minor. Maybe this is dissociation and numbness. It returns to E-flat minor, and maybe this is a kind of relapse. But finally, it sits a little more comfortably as the major third in D-flat major in the coda. Maybe this is a hint at acceptance and healing. I hope it goes without saying that this is one interpretation of one pretty specific detail in an ocean of music. My article has more, but that of course also barely scratches the surface. And while I'm at it, who knows how the band thought or thinks about this. I'm not trying to say that I've figured out what they were trying to do, and by the way, that's never what I'm trying to do on this channel. I only hope that I've given you a new, interesting way of hearing this album and maybe encouraged more people to take harmony seriously in metal, because in my experience, if you actually listen, you'll find a lot of cool, weird ways that bands have of putting pitches together to create logic and meaning. All right, it's time to talk about the biggest public music theory scandal in recent memory in that footnote that I promised. The thing I do of taking a harmonic reduction, that is saying that one harmonic arrangement can kind of be the fundamental sound for a long stretch of music, is a Schenkerian way of thinking about harmony, named after this German dude Heinrich Schenker. And for a lot of reasons, it should be taken with about 100 pounds of salt. He had some cool ideas because his metaphors of depth in musical harmony can be used to say some interesting non-intuitive things about tonal music. The problem is that what basically happened was he liked Mozart and Beethoven's music and made this cool theory about their music and music like theirs, but then said that music that doesn't fit with his theory was inferior and there are way too many people who have used his theory as some sort of absolute way of knowing about musical quality. The upshot is that if you use a theory based on a small amount of music as a mystical way of deciding absolute quality, that sets the stage for the thoroughly silly situation we have in most music schools in the US where a small amount of mostly German music from the late Baroque to the early Romantic periods makes up a hugely disproportionate amount of what gets taught. Philip Ewell pointed this and many other things out as examples of institutional valorization of whiteness in a talk and then an article. That's what Adam Neely's video about music theory and racism is based on. And Phil Ewell is the guy he interviews in it. You should absolutely read his article, by the way, though make sure you realize that he's talking about how things are in academic music theory. There were a lot of angry fools commenting on Adam Neely's video, things to the effect of, but music theory just means thinking about music. How is that racist? And while the answer to that is not simple, I do think there is a very simple misunderstanding a lot of people had. Ewell's article points out how things have been and are now in most places that people call what they're doing music theory, not what the phrase music theory seems like it should mean in the abstract. He also got backlash, a lot of which was at best unprofessional, at worst openly racist, from a bunch of Shankarians who didn't like that he said some unpleasant things about the dead German guy in his theory, and I won't get into the details here, but I'll link something else you can read about it in the description. So anyway, Shankarian methodology has become kind of loaded in a way that it wasn't when I originally did this analysis in my first semester of grad school in 2018. 
but I stand by what I'm doing here for a few reasons. One is that I don't by any means say that what I'm doing gets at any universal truth or anything. That's just silly. Anyone who tells you they're finding objective measures of quality or lack thereof in music is emphatically not worth your time. The other is that there's little of what I did to arrive at this conclusion that a Shankirian would actually recognize as coming from Shankirian theory. I won't get into those details, but I had to change nearly everything about how you would typically shanker something in order to say something interesting about this piece. I think in this case I've hacked the basic idea of harmonic reduction to say something cool about this music and something that isn't just the theory making its own conclusions. I sincerely hope that any music nerds who have watched this far agree. Well, that's a lot of talking. Go set aside the time to listen to this album in full if you haven't ever, or to do so again if you haven't recently. See ya.